Chapter 10, Muddled Message. This prophet Muhammad is a sorcerer, a charlatan, a wizard telling lies. Allah said, I am planning a scheme against them. By examining the Quran in the order it was revealed, and by adding the context of the Islamic traditions, a very disturbing trend emerges. The Islamic deity migrates from a nameless lord to our Rahman, and then to Allah. The spirit starts off demonic, personally involving itself in hellish torments. Then he journeys from foolish to fierce, moving from uninspired tongue lashings to all-out brutality. The Quranic message evolved from simplistic Hanith traditions to dumbed-down subsets of Judaic Talmud, finally settling upon Kusay's arcane pagan rituals. All of these were used to give a terrorist manifesto a veil of religiosity. Then, in a perverse twist of irony, the peoples who supplied the raw materials for Islam became its enemies. The Hanifs were defeated in the bloodiest battles of the War of Compulsions. The Jews suffered genocide at Muhammad's hand. Even the Meccans, who nurtured the pagan religious scam, were conquered by the religion they had inspired. Muhammad was always running away from his God. It was as if proximity was a problem. When he was in Mecca with Allah, his dark spirit was Arachman. Away in Medina, he became Allah. God was always just far enough away to insulate the prophet from his detractor's claims of non-performance. There is something else odd, too. The more Muhammad distanced himself from Allah, and the closer he moved toward the Jews and their repository of scripture, the more the Quran started to sound like the Hebrew Bible, or at least the Talmud. Yet the longer Muhammad stayed with the Jews, the more his God grew to hate them. Ultimately, he ordered his prophets to annihilate the people of the book, upon which Islam's credibility was based. History condemns Islam, which is why Muslims rewrite it. Listen to this attempt by Madudi, our Quran expert. The general chaos and confusion prevailing in Arabia, in which the whole country was in turmoil, has been presented as an argument. Bloodshed, loot, plunder raged on every side. Tribes were subjecting tribes to raids, and no one could have peaceful sleep at night from fear that some enemy tribe might raid his settlement early in the morning. Every Arab was fully conscious of this state of affairs and realized that it was wrong. There is no thought in all of Islamic scholarship that is as essential, as indicting, or as intolerant as this one. Yet the revisionist image of pre-Islamic Arabs as bloodthirsty raiders is widely accepted. Its derogatory overtones are preached because they are essential to the religion's survival. The ugly Arab theory is postulated to fool the feeble-minded into believing that in the context of his times, Muhammad was a godly man, and that Islam made bad men good. But neither hypothesis is true. There is no historical evidence of Arabs conquering their neighbors before Islam. After Islam, Muslims conquered much of the world. Before Islam, there is no evidence of Arabs being looters, who terrorized in violent raids. But that all changed with the advent of Muhammad. Having failed as a religious prophet in Mecca, Allah's messenger became a profiteer and pirate in Medina. Muslims put Arabia in turmoil, spilling blood for plunder. They became a gang who terrorized, raiding settlements and caravans alike. They knew terror, murder, thievery, and the slave trade were wrong, yet they did these things all the same. Their consciences were simply assaged by the Quran. Muhammad and his God said that booty was good and that killing was the surest way to reach the Islamic paradise. Seventh century Arabs were illiterate, isolated, and perhaps even ignorant, but there is no evidence that they were bloodthirsty raiders. Islam turned good men bad. That's why today's Muslims find it essential to revise their past and invert truth. But it is their past, their actual history, that indicts them. Simply stated, Islam perverts men. The closer one gets to it, the more one surrenders to its calling, the more one emulates its prophet and follows the Quran, the more perverted one becomes. Not all Muslims are terrorists. Only the good ones are. 
To find out why, let's return to the Quran. The 106th Surah, named after Muhammad's tribe, the Quraysh, presents the nature of things before Islam. Quran 106, verse 1. For the protection of the Quraysh, there are covenants covering the journeys of trading caravan, so that they can travel safely by winter and summer. So let them worship the Lord of this house, the Kaaba, he who provides them with food and with security against fear and danger. This is a fairly accurate reflection of pre-Islamic Mecca, its caravans, covenants, protective months, and Kaaba. The hundredth surah foreshadows what was to come. Quran 100, verse 1. I call to witness the cavalry steeds, the snorting courses that run breathing pantingly, rushing off to battle, striking sparks of fire, scouring to the raid at dawn, raising clouds of dust as they penetrate deep into the mist of foe en masse. The most vicious Islamic raids deployed cavalry. As such, the Prophet molded his religion to reward those who fought astride horses. The kind of religious fighting hinted at in the hundredth surah came to be known as jihad. The Quran would call it Allah's cause, but by either definition it became Islam's principal attribute and its most enduring symbol. Bukhari a man came to Allah's apostle and said, Instruct me as to such a deed as equals jihad and reward. He replied, I do not find such a deed. Then he added, Can you, while the Muslim fighter is still in the battlefield, enter your mosque to perform prayers without ceasing and fast forever? The man said, But who can do that? In other words, eternal fasting and prayer is less religious than being a jihadist murderer. Cavalry was essential to his success, so the religious prophet crafted scripture to reward man and mount. Bukhari. The prophet said, Good will remain in the foreheads of horses for jihad, for they bring about a reward in paradise or booty. The best of both worlds theme was how Muhammad would ultimately sell Islam to his gang of misfits. Bukhari again. The prophet said, if somebody keeps a horse in Allah's cause, motivated by his promise, then he will be rewarded for what the horse has eaten or drunk, and for its dung and urine. Allah's apostle said, horses are kept for one of three purposes. For some they are a source of reward, for others a means of shelter, and for some a source of sins. The one for whom they are a source of reward is he who keeps a horse for Allah's cause, that is, jihad. As we move from the delusion of Mecca to the terror of Medina, keep these hadith in mind. To Muhammad, Allah's cause was synonymous with jihad, and both were about fighting. The Quran, 7th century version of Blitzkrieg, was followed by... Quran 100, verse 6. Lo, a man is an ingrate to his lord... To that fact he bears witness by his deeds. Violent is he in his love of worldly goods, tenacious in the pursuit. From the day he arrived in Yathrib to the day he died, Muhammad's deeds were violent. He led terrorist raids in tenacious pursuit of worldly goods. Islam's prophet was the most violent and covetous man ever to have spoken on God's behalf. As such, these words bear witness to the fraud he perpetrated and to his hypocrisy. Quran 100 verse 9 Does he not know when that which is in the graves is poured forth and the secrets of men are exposed that their Lord will be aware? The secrets buried in the victims' graves cry out, Muhammad must be exposed. At this point, I would like to alter course. There is only so much ugliness one can endure without a break. So rather than dissect the remainder of the early Meccan revelations in their entirety, I'm going to provide a Best of Muhammad by subject. But first, a Maduti introduction. These surahs were sent down when persecution of Muslims was near its climax. Their theme was to warn the disbelievers of the evil consequences of the persecution and tyranny that they were perpetrating on the converts to Islam and to console believers. If Muslims remain firm and steadfast against tyranny and coercion, they will be rewarded richly for it. Islamic logic is funny in a twisted sort of way. 
while mocking the self-proclaimed prophet could hardly be called tyranny, today's most coercive and tyrannical nations are Islamic. They have become what they detested. As with the child abuse that gave rise to Islam, Muslims have come full circle. The abused have become abusers. I'm going to provide a Best of Mohammed by subject. But first, a Madudi introduction. These surahs were sent down when persecution of Muslims was near its climax. Their theme was to warn the disbelievers of the evil consequences of the persecution and tyranny that they were perpetrating on the converts to Islam, and to console believers. If Muslims remain firm and steadfast against tyranny and coercion, they will be rewarded richly for it. Islamic logic is funny, in a twisted sort of way. While mocking the self-proclaimed prophet could hardly be called tyranny, today's most coercive and tyrannical nations are Islamic. They have become what they detested. As with the child abuse that gave rise to Islam, Muslims have come full circle. The abused have become abusers. Even Madudi seems to agree. Allah will avenge himself on those who persecute you by burning the unbelievers to death and casting them into pits full of fire. The disbelievers will not only be punished in hell for their disbelief, but more than that, they will suffer punishment by fire as fit recompense for their tyranny and cruelties. Allah's grip is very severe. If you are proud of your strength, you should know that Pharaoh and the Thamud were stronger and more numerous. Therefore, you should learn a lesson from the fate they met. Allah's power has so encompassed you that you cannot escape his encirclement, and the Quran that you are bent upon belying is unchangeable. It is inscribed in the preserved tablet, which cannot be corrupted in any way. Although it does a world-class job of corrupting. The themes that follow are Muhammad's favorites. We'll start with a sampling of how the Islamic deity responded to those who challenged his prophet's credentials. Quran 76, verse 4. For the rejecters we have prepared chains, iron collars, manacles, and a blazing fire. 77, verse 39. If you have a trick or a plot, use it against me. If you have any wit, outwit me. Woe to the rejecters. 78 verse 28. They called our proofs, signs, and verses, false with strong denial. We have recorded everything in a book, so taste that which you earned. We will give you nothing but torment. Quran 83 verse 10. Woe to those who deny, reject our message, and repudiate. When our verses are rehearsed, they say, Tales of the ancients, mere fables of old. 83 verse 29. The disbelievers used to laugh at believers. When they passed by them, they winked at one another in mockery. When they returned to their folk, they would jest, but soon the believers will laugh at the unbelievers, sitting on high thrones, gazing. The unbelievers will be paid back for what they did. 84, verse 22. The unbelievers reject Muhammad and the Quran. They deny and lie. Allah has full knowledge of what they secrete. So announce to them tidings of a terrible torment. Quran 84, verse 20. What is the matter with them that they do not believe? And when the Quran is recited to them that they do not fall prostrate in adoration. 85 verse 10. Those who try or tempt the believers will have the penalty of hell. They will have the doom of the burning fire. Verily, the seizure of the Lord is severe and painful. Allah will encompass them from behind. He will punish them. Nay, this is a glorious Quran. 86 verse 15. They are plotting a scheme against you. But I also am planning a scheme against them. That was as direct as it was unpleasant. Accept Muhammad or suffer the consequences. Dissent is not to be tolerated. With the mockers warned, it was time to terrorize them. Quran 77 verse 29. 
It will be said, Depart to the doom, those who used to deny. Depart to a shadow of smoke from the hell fire, ascending in three columns, which yields no relief or shelter and is of no use against the fierce blaze. Verily, hell throws off sparks, huge as castles, as if they were yellow camels. Quran 78, verse 21. Truly hell is as a place of ambush, a resort for the rebellious, a dwelling place for the disbelievers. They will abide there forever. Therein they taste neither coolness nor any drink, save a boiling water and a fluid, dark, murky, intensely cold, paralyzing, a dirty wound discharge. It is a fitting reward for them. Quran 84, verse 10. Soon he will cry for perdition invoking destruction, throwing them into the scorching fire. They shall enter the fire and be forced to taste its burning. 85 verse 1 I swear by the zodiacal signs, woe to the makers of the pit of fire, cursed were the people of the ditch. 85 verse 5 The fire is supplied abundantly with fuel. 101 verse 8 he whose balance is light will abide in the bottomless pit. And what will make you know what it is? It is a fire blazing fiercely. The hellfire is Allah's resort for the rebellious. It's for those who don't surrender. To avoid this hellish doom, submit to Muhammad and obey him. A drunken brothel shall be your just dessert. Quran 76 verse 5 as for the righteous, they will drink a cup of wine from a spring, making it gush forth abundantly. 76 verse 19, And round them shall serve immortal boys of perpetual freshness, never altering in age. If you saw them, you would think they were scattered pearls. Quran 76 verse 21, Upon them will be given green garments of fine green silk and heavy gold brocade. They will be adorned with bracelets of silver. Their Lord will slack their thirst with wine. Quran 77 verse 41. The righteous shall be amidst cool shades, springs and fruits, all they desire. Eat and drink to your heart's content. 78 verse 31. Verily, for those who follow us, there will be a fulfillment of your desires, enclosed gardens, grape vines, voluptuous, full-breasted maidens of equal age, and a cup full to the brim of wine. There they never hear vain discourse nor lying, a gift in payment, a reward from your Lord. Quran 83, verse 22. The believers will be in delightful bliss, on couch-like thrones, gazing. Their thirst will be slaked with pure wine. 85 verse 11. For those who believe and do good deeds will be gardens, the fulfillment of all desires. Muhammad not only created God in his image, he crafted a paradise that mirrored his fantasies. It was filled with thrones, free-flowing wine, perpetual virgins, ever voluptuous. And there were no mockers, never was heard vain discourse nor line, and that, I suppose, would eliminate recitals of the Koran. Paradise indeed. But it was all for naught if the Islamic God was not. The following Allahisms are proof he wasn't divine. Quran 76 verse 1 there came over man a period of time when he was a thing not worth mentioning. 76 verse 2. We created man from nutfa, drops of mingled sperm, sexual discharge of men and women, in order to try him. We gave him the gifts of hearing and sight. 76 verse 15. Goblets made of silver, crystal clear and transparent. 76 verse 28. When we want, we can replace man by substituting another in his stead. 77 verse 20. Have we not created you from despicable fluid? Then we placed it in a place of safety for a known period, because we measure, and we are the best to measure. 77 verse 25. Have we not made the earth a receptacle for the living and the dead? 78 6. Have we not made the earth as a bed and the mountains pegs? 78.37 
the Lord with whom they cannot dare to speak. None can converse with him. None are able to address him. 84.16 But nay, I swear by the night, and all that enshrouds which drives it on, and by the moon in her fullness, you shall journey on from plain to plain. 86 verse 5 So let man consider from what he is created. He is created from gushing water pouring forth, coming from beneath the backbone and the ribs. 99.1 When the earth is shaken to her violent convulsions and throws up her burdens, man cries, What is the matter with her? She declares her tidings and she relates her chronicles, for he will give her inspiration. Quran 86.13 Lo, this Quran is a conclusive word. It is not a thing for amusement. It is no pleasantry, and it is no joke. Man isn't worth mentioning, and he can easily be replaced. To try us, God gave us hearing and sight. Perhaps we are to use them to see the earth as a receptacle and to hear it speak with inspiration. Two verses were more fatal than frivolous. The Lord with whom they cannot dare to speak, none can converse with him. None are able to address him. If that's true, why prostrate oneself five times a day in prayer? And what is the difference between not being able to converse with God and having no God at all? This Quran is a conclusive word. It is not a thing for amusement. It is no pleasantry. And it is no joke. It is neither funny pleasant nor amusing, but it is conclusive. It proves that Mohammed was a fraud and that Allah wasn't God. I feel compelled to issue a warning. Islamic material will put you to sleep. It's poorly written, disorganized, and directionless. Do not operate your life while under its influence, as serious injury or death may result. The following pages are an expose on early Quran surahs. Much of the material is incoherent. Devoid of context and chronology, these surahs are odious and repetitive rants. Yet their muddled message is the essence of Islamic religiosity, so I feel compelled to review them with you. Madudi wants us to believe that the opposite is true. He claims that the religion of Islam, as presented in the Quran, is beautifully comprised of three fundamental doctrines. Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, to whom we have yet to meet. The Apostleship of Muhammad, whose apostleship is covered in the Sunnah, not Quran. And the belief that the dead are raised bodily, not spiritually. The 112th Surah, Pure Faith, teaches Tawheed, pure and undefiled. Therefore the Prophet regarded this one Surah as equal to one-third of the Quran. Quran 112, verse 1. Say, He is God, the One, the self-sufficient Master, whom all creatures need. He has begotten no one, nor is He begotten. There is no one comparable to Him. Thank God for small favors. Two gods like this one would be two too many. But Muhammad's suggestion that this one-sentence surah was equal to one-third of the Quran is too delicious for words. If only it were true. The Quran's final two surahs reinforce what we already know, and with their conclusion we will have analyzed every surah from the 67th through the 114th, most of them in their entirety. This is the ultimate confession. Quran 113 verse 1 Say, I seek refuge with the Lord of the dawn from the mischief of the evil he created. Islam's dark spirit, the morning star, the prince of darkness, created the mischief of evil. By admitting it this blatantly, Satan has insulted our intelligence and declared that he inspired Muhammad. 113 verse 3 From the mischievous evil of darkness, as it becomes intensely dark, from the mischief of those who practice the evil of malignant witchcraft and blowing on knots, from the mischievous evil of the envier when he covets. I was taught that it is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open one's mouth and remove all doubt. Muhammad is indicting his own behavior. He did the very things he claimed were demonic. As proof that Muhammad was guilty of the mischievous evil of darkness and that he practiced 
the evil of malignant witchcraft and blowing. I present these confessions. Bukhari. I heard the prophet saying, if anyone sees something he dislikes, he should blow three times on his left side, and its evil will not harm him. When the prophet became ill, he used to blow his breath over his body, hoping for its blessing. When the prophet went to bed, he would cup his hands together and blow over them, reciting surahs. He would then rub his hands over whatever parts of his body he could reach, starting with his head, face, and frontal areas. If those who practice the evil of malignant witchcraft and blowing are demonic, Muhammad has introduced us to his revealing spirit. This next hadith is especially incriminating, as it is entirely satanic. Its author is Asia, Muhammad's favorite wife. Bukhari. Magic was worked on the prophet so that he began to believe he was doing a thing which he was not actually doing. In other words, an evil spell caused him to hallucinate and lie. Such is the nature of men possessed by demons. One day he said, I feel that Allah, actually Satan, has inspired me as to how to cure myself. Two persons these would be demons, came to me in my dream. One of them asked the other, What is the ailment of this man? He has been bewitched, and he is under a spell of magic. Who cast the magic spell? A Jew. What material did he use? A comb, the hair knotted on it, and the outer skin of the pollen of a male date palm. Where did it come from? It is in the well of Darwan. So the prophet went to the well. Upon his return, he said, The date palms are like the heads of devils. I asked, Did you blow out those things with which the magic was worked? He said, No, for I have been cured by Allah, and I am afraid that this action may spread evil among the people. Denial, hallucinations, paranoia, and deceit are all part of the demonic recipe. Muhammad didn't want the story out, because it was so incriminating. He became what he condemned, and he knew it. The 114th surah is the last because it is brief. Muslims admit that the Quran is out of order, a symbol longest to shortest surah, but they make no attempt to reorder it chronologically, or even to illuminate it by attaching it to the context of Muhammad's life. The reasons are clear. Out of order and devoid of context, it is confusing. In order and in context, it is devastating. Quran 114, verse 1. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of men and jinn. Remember, jinn are demons. The king of men and jinn, the Ilah, or God, of men and jinn. In all but two of my translations of the man. Surah, Ilah for God was replaced by God with a lowercase g. Since Muhammad and his fellow Muslims capitalize words for no apparent reason, not capitalizing God is significant. And since the position of the political titles of Lord and King were capitalized, not elevating God could have been Muhammad's way of letting us know who begat whom. Even the devil earned a trio of capitalizations. Quran 114 verse 4 from the evil of the sneaking devil who whispers evil and withdraws after his whisper, the slinking Satan, the same who whispers into the hearts of mankind from among the jinn and men. Wouldn't you know it, the Quran ends as it began with an evil spirit. Satan is sneaking around, whispering evil to jinn and men. How appropriate. Unfortunately, the end of the Quran doesn't mean the end of Islam. Muhammad was on a mission, one that hadn't gone very well. The Hanif well had run dry, and the Meccans remained unconvinced. So the wannabe prophet decided to change his quibla, his god, and his inspiration. With the next thirty-nine surahs, we enter the second Meccan period. The Jews were gradually replacing the Quraysh on the Quran's center stage, just as the Bible began to dominate Islamic scripture. As we shall discover, this was a very unpleasant time for Muhammad. In our quest to understand fundamental Islam, let's dive into the 56th surah named The Inevitable. 
It is revealing in that it establishes heaven and hell and Muhammad's image. It is incriminating in that there is no chance these lurid depictions are divine. Like so much of the Quran, the inevitable is style devoid of substance. It has become Muhammad's style to profess an intimate knowledge of heaven and hell, regaling us with vivid teases and torments. They have become the carrot and whip of his self-indulgent rise to power. But the Islamic path remains unlit, while the Prophet's fiery hell and lustful heaven have been detailed to distraction, we have precious little doctrine upon which to navigate his new creed. Surrender or die is clear enough, but it's clearly not enough to call Muhammad's creation a religion. Islam's oracle opens the surah as the prophet of doom. Quran 56 verse 1 when the inevitable event befalls abasing, there will be no denying. The Meccans ridiculed most everything Muhammad said, so the wannabe prophet retreated to his imaginary realm, a place he created, a place no one could deny. 56 verse 3, Bringing low, exalting, the earth shall be shaken with a terrible shaking, and the mountains shall be made to crumble with crumbling so they shall become powdered dust, floating particles. According to the Islamic prophet, the shaking and crumbling was to occur in the year 1110 A.D., half an Islamic day, or 500 normal years, from his coronation as Allah's last messenger. Since the calamitous events known as the Day of Doom was Muhammad's most important and oft-repeated prophecy, and since it remains unfulfilled 900 years hence, might we be entitled to question his prophetic credentials? Quran 56, verse 7. And you shall be three groups, so those on the right hand. What will be the companions of the right hand? And the companions of the left hand? What will be the companions of the left hand? And those foremost will be foremost. These are they who are nearest. Draw nigh in gardens of delight. These questions remain unanswered throughout this divine revelation. If they were important enough for God to ask, you'd think they would merit an answer. For if we become lefties simply because Allah's fickle hand of fate rubbed Adam's back the wrong way, predestining us to hell, let's bury this religion and free everyone from its impoverished legacy. If a little heavenly petting is the foundation of Islam, let's wave goodbye and rid the world of the terror it inspires. Quran 56 verse 13 A multitude of those from among the first and a few from the latter will be on couch-like thrones woven with gold and precious stones reclining, facing each other round about them will serve boys of perpetual freshness of never-ending bloom with goblets, jugs and cups filled with sparkling wine no aching of the head will they receive, nor suffer any madness, nor exhaustion, and with fruits any that they may select, and the flesh of fowls any that they may desire. And there will be hoor, or fair females, with big eyes, lovely and pure, beautiful ones, like unto hidden pearls, well guarded in their shells, a reward for the deeds." Allah's brothel, the best little whorehouse in Mecca. Let's check out Muhammad's hadith on the subject. First we learn that heaven's rewards will send you to hell. Bukhari, I heard the prophet saying, From among my followers there will be some who will consider illegal sexual intercourse, the wearing of silk, the drinking of alcoholic drinks, and the use of musical instruments to be lawful. Allah will destroy them during the night and will let the mountains fall on them. He will transform the rest into monkeys and pigs, and they will remain so until the day of doom. Bukhari. The prophet said, In paradise they will not urinate, relieve nature, spit, or have any nasal secretions. Everyone there will have two versions who will be so beautiful and transparent, the bones of their legs will be seen through their flesh. Hypocrisy revealed. Let's return to the Quran's depiction of paradise. Quran 56.25 They hear no vain speaking nor backbiting, only saying the word, 
Peace. Peace. Only saying one word is going to make the Islamic paradise a very boring place. No wonder Allah is providing such a rich menu of entertainment options. The companions of the right hand. What will be the companions of the right hand? Here we go again. The question is asked, but not answered. The surah tells us the fate of the righties without a hint as to who they are or what they did to gain entrance into Allah's brothel. Among thornless lote trees and among tall or banana trees with flowers piled high in shades long extended by water flowing constantly and fruit in abundance whose season is not limited nor forbidden. The Islamic paradise continues to reflect the parochial view of an abandoned orphan boy struggling to survive the rigors of an unrelenting desert. It's comprised of fruits, fowl, shade, flowing water, comfy seating, and attentive servants, Viagra-like wine, and lusty virgins. It's a place to die for, but fair warning, I wouldn't trust a god whose reward in paradise, drinking and fornication, is what he forbids on earth. The Islamic paradise continues to reflect the parochial view of an abandoned orphan boy struggling to survive the rigors of an unrelenting desert. It's comprised of fruits, fowl, shade, flowing water, comfy seating, and attentive servants, Viagra-like wine, and lusty virgins. It's a place to die for, but fair warning, I wouldn't trust a god whose reward in paradise, drinking and fornication, is what he forbids on earth. Quran 56 verse 34 On couches or thrones raised high, verily we have created them, the maidens, incomparable. We have formed their maidens as a special creation and made them to grow a new growth. We made them virgins, pure and undefiled, lovers matched in age. Muhammad is telling his young recruits that their virgins will regain their virginity after each conquest. They grow a new growth. He is also telling them that the Islamic paradise is for men only. Their lovers are a special creation, not women of this world. And to satisfy their most lustful cravings, their sex partners are plentiful, as in more than one. Their incomparable maidens, special companions, Virgins and lovers are always plural. It's Islam's menage a trois. And while Allah dispenses with how the right-handers manage to score their decadent reward, He tells us from whence they came. Quran 56 verse 39 A numerous company from among the first, and a goodly number from those of later times. But enough of this frivolity. It's time to roast some infidels. Quran 56, verse 41. The companions of the left hand. What will be the companions of the left hand? They will be in the midst of a fierce blast of hot wind and in boiling water and a shadow of black smoke, neither cool nor pleasant. For that they were wont to be indulged. Heretofore they were effete with luxury and persisted obstinately in the great violation. The great lefty violation was the abandonment of an orphan boy, depriving him of a share of the family business, and then rejecting his prophetic claims. Quran 56, verse 47. And they used to say, What? When did we die and become dust and bones? Shall we then be resurrected? Also our forefathers? Say, Yea, those of old and those of later times all will be gathered together for the tryst, a meeting appointed for a day well known. This is Mohammed's day of doom, in which men are exhumed from the grave, their bones and flesh reassembled, so that they can burn in lust while others burn in hell. It's flesh that is gratified and roasted, not spirit. Quran 56 verse 51 then, moreover, verily you, the erring ones, the deniers, you will surely taste the tree of Zakum and fill your bellies with it, and drink boiling water on top of it. Indeed, you shall drink like diseased camels raging with thirst. Such will be their entertainment, their welcome on the day of doom. If nothing else, you have to give Mohammed credit for originality. 
it's hard to imagine a god this entertaining, albeit in a demented way. Quran 56 verse 57 It is we who have created you. Admit the truth and then surrender. That's Islam in a nutshell. Admit Muhammad is a prophet and then acquiesce to his will, or you will eat thorns and drink scalding water. Then tell me the semen that you admit, throwing out. Is it you who created, or we the creators? It's only natural. The god of lust is the god of semen. We have decreed, or predestined, or ordained, death for you all, and we are not to be frustrated from replacing you with others in forms that you know not. Muhammad and Allah shared many things in common, including the thought that men were replaceable. They use fiery threats and lustful taunts to seduce an unending supply of martyrs to fight and die for things they coveted. Islam wasn't invented to save men, but to abuse them. Quran 56.68 Have you observed the water which you drink? Do you shed it from clouds, or are we the shedder? If we pleased, we could have made it salty and bitter. Why do you not give thanks? Yeah, the shedder thing was scientifically inaccurate and hardly proof. So would you believe... Have you observed the fire which you kindle? Is it you that produced the trees for it, or are we the producers? Now you know why Yahweh chose to use miracles and prophecies to prove the Bible's divine inspiration. Unable to do either, Allah just stammered. 56 verse 73 We, even we, have made it. I suppose that would be wood. A memorial of hell fire, and an article of comfort and convenience for the denizens of deserts. Where there are fewer trees than anywhere else. Therefore celebrate with praises the name of thy Lord, the Tremendous. Quran 56 verse 75 Furthermore, I call to witness the falling stars, and that is indeed a mighty adjuration, a tremendous oath. If only you knew that this indeed is a noble recitation of the Quran. Among the long lines of unintelligible segues, this is a standout. We transitioned from calling incinerating space pebbles mighty witnesses to the Quran being noble. In a book kept hidden that is protected, which none shall touch but those who are clean, the purified ones. Time out. A revelation, by definition, can't be hidden. Since this revelation, the Quran, is the foundation of Islam, how did they manage to foul that up? A revelation from the Lord of men and jinn. It is such a talk that you would hold it in light esteem, a statement to scorn? Do you then hold this announcement in contempt? In a word, yes, as did the Meccans who knew it and Mohammed best. The next ten verses are so muddled, the message is undecipherable, even with the Arabic translators adding 47 words to help their God out. Quran 56, verse 82. And instead of thanking for the provision he gives you, you deny him my disbelief. To give it the lie, you make your means of subsistence. Then why do you not intervene when the soul of the dying man reaches the throat, and you the while sit looking on, but we, our angels who take souls, are nearer unto him than you, but you see not? Then why do you see not if you are exempt from future account punishment, and not in bondage unto us? Do you not force it, the soul, back into its body? If you are true in the claim of independence, thus then... If he, the dying person, is of those drawn nigh, there is for him breath of life and plenty and a garden of delight. And if he is of those of the right hand, then greeting, safety, and peace from the punishment of Allah. If this is divinely inspired scripture, then I am William Shakespeare. In the final verses of the 56th surah, Muhammad's dark spirit returns to his favorite subject. Quran 56, verse 92. But if he, the dying person, be of the denying of the day of doom, erring away from Islam, then for him is the entertainment with boiling water and roasting in hell fire. Verily, this is the absolute truth with certainty. So celebrate, Muhammad. 
stunning. The entertainment for those who reject this dark dogma is to be roasted and boiled. What kind of a god would tell his prophet to celebrate human torture? Since no god could possibly be this disturbed, this demented, should Muhammad be despised for perpetrating this fraud or pitied? Should Muslims be freed from this delusion or should we simply sit back and watch them celebrate their torturous act of terror today? In exposing Islam, I have erred on the side of the Quran and Hadith. That is to say, I have been nearly as repetitious as they have been by bringing the doctrine's most holy books together chronologically and placing them in the context of time and place. The evidence piles up one confession at a time. The truth ultimately becomes undeniable. Therefore, I will continue to present their scriptures as completely as your endurance allows. By observing a constant pattern of behavior, you will be able to render an accurate assessment. In this light, let's dissect the 52nd surah, Kiss and cousin to the 56th. Quran 52, verse 1. I call to witness Tur, or Mount Sinai, and a scripture book inscribed, written on a fine parchment scroll, unrolled, and the house ever peopled, and the roof raised high, and the sea kept filled. The Islamic spirit is trying to pull a fast one. The house wasn't ever peopled. As you will discover in the source material appendix, there is no archaeological or historical evidence to show that Mecca even existed before the 6th century. Therefore, Islam's foundation is based upon a lie, because without people it would have been impossible to pass on any semblance of Islamic ritual from Abraham to Kusay. Elsewhere in the Quran, we're told that the book was chiseled on memorial tablets, not inscribed on perishable parchment rolls. But that's the least of the Quranic headaches. It claims, as Madudi confirms, that it was first written before creation, and that it was passed down and maintained in its original form, verbatim. The Quran that you are bent upon belying is unchangeable. It is inscribed in the preserved tablet, which cannot be corrupted in any way. Since the Quranic claims regarding its origin and nature are essential to our understanding, I'd like to explore this matter more completely. Allah's book says of itself, Quran 12, verse 1, These are verses of the Immaculate Book, a clear discourse. Immaculate means perfect, flawless, inerrant. We've already discovered scores of errors, big and small. Quran 12, verse 3, through the Quran, we narrate the best of histories. Yet it is devoid of history. It doesn't even provide any context. Quran 2, verse 1. This is a book free of doubt. Uh, well, that's true, but not in the way it was intended. Quran 10, verse 37. This Quran is such a writing that none but Allah could have composed it. It confirms what has been revealed before. Not only would the behavior in the Islamic heaven be illegal in every state save the brothels of Nevada, the Quran contradicts rather than confirms the prior revelation. It says it inspired. What's more, the writing quality is an embarrassment. While lecturing on creation, Allah's prophet professed, All that was going to be written on the memorial tablet before anything else was created. And that is particularly odd, since everything we have read thus far has been fixated on one man's quest for gold and glory. Said another way, the Quran's revelation are temporal, and they only serve Muhammad. The reason I bring this to your attention is to scuttle the Islamic claim that the Quran is a perfect reflection of the original tablet inscribed in heaven. The earliest Quranic writings all differ with each other. They conflict with the present version. Coins from 685 A.D. have inscriptions that don't match today's surahs. The scripture inside the Dome of the Rock, 691 A.D., also varies. Further, the earliest copies of the Quran were written without any vowels, and the diacritical dots that modern Arabic uses to determine what letter is intended. It wasn't until the late 8th century, more than 150 years after Muhammad's death, that Islamic scholars added the diacritical marks to clear up countless ambiguities. In so doing, they chose the letters and vowels, and thus the current words, punctuation, and meaning. They translated what was essentially code into the gibberish we are reading today. 
Then there is the problem of the parchments themselves. The oldest fragments date to the 8th century, not the 7th. They were found in a paper grave in the loft rafters of the Mosque of Sharia in 1972. Aberrations from the accepted text abound, including the order of the verses, textual variations, and artistic embellishments. Gerd Puen, the leader of the German team analyzing the scrolls, said, Revisions are very clearly written over earlier, washed-off versions. What the Yemeni Quran suggests is an evolving text, rather than the Word of God revealed in its entirety to the Prophet Muhammad. Puen went on to declare, The Quran claims for itself that it is mubin, or clear. If you look at it, you will notice that every fifth sentence or so doesn't make any sense. A fifth of the Quranic text is incomprehensible. This is what has caused the anxiety regarding translation. If the Quran is not comprehensible, if it can't even be understood in Arabic, then it's not translatable into any language. This stark reality is frightening to Orthodox Muslims who parrot their prophet's claim that the Quran has been preserved perfectly, unchanged and inerrant, just as Allah wrote it. The perfection claim Allah makes on behalf of his Quran would be impossible even if Allah were God. Language is an imperfect tool. One word can mean many things, and meanings often change with inflection. Connotation is altered by context, something the Quran lacks. Knowing the time, place, and parties to a conversation is required to establish the intended implication. For example, the classical Arabic word used for fighting could just as easily be translated killing and the word for virgin is indistinguishable from the classic Arabic word for white grape. Yahweh knew better. He never said his scripture was inerrant. He said it was sufficient. But while we're on the subject, I'd like to share something you might find interesting. There are a thousand prophecies in the Bible, most of which are exacting. There have been no misses. There are thousands of detailed historical depictions in the text, none of which has ever been shown to be invalid. The Quran's obsession with demented torments is proof of a different kind of inspiration. Its fixation on fatalism, the annihilation of choice, and therefore the impossibility of love, provides another salient clue as to the nature of Islam's dark spirit. Quran 52, verse 7 Verily the doom and torment of your Lord will surely come to pass. There is none that can avert it or ward it off. This God is a nasty and violent fellow. 52 verse 9. On the day when heaven will heave in dreadful shaking, trembling, and the mountains will fly hither and thither, woe to those who reject me, that play in shallow trifles and sport in vain discourses. That day they will be pushed down by force, thrust with a horrible thrust into the fire of hell. Unable to resist, they shall be driven to the fire with violence. This is demented. Quran 52, verse 14. This, it will be said, is the fire which you used to deny. Is this a magic fake? Burn therein. Endure the heat. Taste it. It's the same whether you bear it patiently or not. This is my retaliation for what you did. This, too, is blatantly demonic. Those who are willing to trust a spirit that is carnal shall be rewarded in like fashion. That is, if he's not the devil. Quran 52, verse 17. Verily, the mutakan, those who fear, will be in gardens of delight, enjoying the bliss which their Lord has provided. And their Lord save them from the torment of the blazing fire. Eat and drink with glee because of what you used to do. Damning, robbing, enslaving, and murdering people for me. They will recline with ease on throne couches of dignity, arranged in ranks, and we shall join them to beautiful Hur, the female maidens, with big lustrous eyes. The fact that heaven and hell are consistently depicted in Muhammad's parochial image is a sign that his passions inspired this part of the Quran, not God's. Quran 52 verse 21 Those who believe and whose families follow them in faith, to them we shall join their offspring. 
nor shall we deprive them of their works, yet each individual is in pledge for his deeds. Imagine that. Wives and children will be joined to their husbands and fathers who are converting with the virgins. Well, that ought to be entertaining. And we shall provide fruit and meat, anything they desire. There they shall pass from hand to hand a wine cup free of frivolity, free of all taint of vanity or cause of sin. Allah's brew of free frivolity sounds like a date rape drug. This less than heavenly picture continues with these perverse strokes. Quran 52 verse 24. Round about them will serve devoted to them young boy servants of their own, handsome as well-guarded pearls. In previous verses, Allah used the well-guarded pearl reference to designate virgins, maidens, whose virtue was hidden or protected in closed shells. Now, in reference to handsome and devoted boy servants, it sounds like homosexuality. They will advance to each other, drawing near, engaging in mutual equity. They will say, we used to be afraid of the punishment in the midst of our families, but Allah has been good to us and has delivered us from the torment of the scorching wind and breath of fire. Could Allah be saying that they previously suppressed their homosexual urges for fear of their family's wrath, but now they are out of the closet? Quran 52 verse 28 We used to invoke him before, truly he the benign, the merciful. A benign and merciful tormentor. Now there's a thought. I can only wonder how Muslims justify the obvious contradiction between their God's definition and His behavior. Therefore, remind, by the grace of your Lord, you are no vulgar soothsayer, nor are you a possessed madman. Another translation reads, Therefore, warn, men, Muhammad, by the grace of Allah, you are neither a soothsayer nor a madman. Either way, it's evidence that neither Muhammad nor the Meccans were convinced. Quran 52, verse 30. Or do they say, A poet! We await for him some evil accidental calamity hatched by time. Say, Await you! I too will wait along with you. From another translation. Say unto them, Accept your fill. Lo, I am with you among the expectant with the words that the Islamic scholar arbitrarily added to the text to make the message seem rational removed, the verse actually reads, Say, accept, lo, I am with you among the expectant. Why scholars may quibble over the meaning, I think one thing is clear. Illiterate men ought not to author scripture. Ali's translation explains, Do they say, he is a poet from whom we expect an adverse turn of fortune? How perceptive the Meccans saw Muhammad as a con artist, ready to pick their pockets. And he did. The poet robbed their caravans, stole their town, and then usurped all rights associated with their religious scam. To rebut his critics, the pot called the kettle black. Quran 52, verse 32. Is it that their mental faculties of understanding urge them to do this? Or are they an outrageous folk, transgressing beyond the bounds? While the never-ending argument between the Meccans and Muhammad over the Prophet's lack of prophetic credentials is wearisome, this verse demonstrates the Quran's lack of divine inspiration. An all-knowing God would never have asked such a question. As the argument raged on, Muhammad's kin were ever more convinced that the wannabe Prophet was simply fabricating his divine credentials so as to steal their money. Quran 52, verse 33. Or do they say he fabricated? Nay, they will never believe. Let them then produce a recital, or speech, or announcement, or discourse. The like unto it, if they speak the truth. The Meccans knew what we have learned. Muhammad was making this up as he went along. And the best the prophet could do was say, Prove I'm lying by producing a recital as good as this. The early Hanif poem by Zayed, upon which the early surahs are based, was easily as good, if not much, much better. And the Bible, from which later surahs were plagiarized, was infinitely more rational, more prophetic, and godly. Therefore, based upon the challenge, Muhammad's recitals were false. We have called his bluff, 
But then again, it wasn't a big deal. As you shall soon see, Adolf Hitler's rants were better than this. Quran 52, verse 35. Were they created of nothing, or were they themselves their creators, or did they create the heavens and earth? Nay, they have no certainty. Do they possess the treasures of your Lord, or are they the tyrant treasurers set in absolute authority to do as they like? With the Kaaba ink. Now that's our boy. Mohammed saw himself as the one set in absolute authority to do anything he liked. As such, he was empowered to pirate treasures and cavort immorally without recrimination. Moreover, he actually got away with it. Pressing his case, the Lord is alleged to have asked, In Quran 52.38, Or have they a ladder by which they can climb up to heaven and listen to its secrets? Then let such a listener of theirs produce a warning, manifesting proof. According to Muhammad, Adam bumped his head on heaven, so the Islamic heaven isn't very high. A ladder would have been sufficient. Moreover, since Mecca was devoid of wood and carpenters, just building a ladder would have been a bigger miracle than Muhammad or his dark spirit ever mustered. Quran 52.39 Or has he, Allah, only daughters, and you have sons? The prophet ought to have stopped when he was down and left us in doubt. Muhammad's Lord is demeaning the Meccan rock idol, Allah. He is saying that he isn't worthy because he had daughters, not sons. Allah's daughters were fellow rock idols, Alat, Aluza, and Manat, of satanic verse fame. Since boys were viewed as better than girls, Muhammad's dark spirit is implying that Allah was a low-life loser. And make no mistake, Allah was the only Meccan deity with daughters. This exact same verse was repeated later in the Quran as a way of digging Muhammad out of his devilish dilemma when he confessed to mistaking Satan for Allah. Quran 52.40 Or is it that you demand a reward or fee from them for preaching Islam, so that they are burdened with expense and a load of debt, or that the Gahib, the unseen, is in their hands and that they have it written down? Or do they intend a plot against you, staging a deception? But those who defy and seek to ensnare the messenger are themselves being plotted against and will be tricked. Quran 52.40 Or is it that you demand a reward or fee from them for preaching Islam, so that they are burdened with expense and a load of debt, or that the Gahib, the unseen, is in their hands, and that they have it written down? Or do they intend a plot against you, staging a deception? But those who defy and seek to ensnare the messenger are themselves being plotted against, and will be tricked. Muhammad's Lord is saying that the Meccans are lucky, that he isn't charging them for these spiritual insights. Further, he is implying that they are impoverished because they haven't written any scripture. Mind you, Muhammad hadn't written any either, and none of them could have read it, even if he had. Then he goes off on his favorite conspiracy theory, everyone is plotting against my guy, which isn't actually true. Only those who knew Muhammad were interested in exposing his plot. The verse ends with one of many confessions. The Islamic God is a trickster. He plots against men. So why do Muslims trust the word of an admittedly deceitful spirit? How do they know he's not deceiving them? As with so much of the Quran, the next verse doesn't fit with the rest of the surah, and thus was probably revealed much later. Up to this point, the Lord has been unnamed, and Allah has been demeaned. Now we're being told that there is no illa, but Allah. Quran 52.43 or have they an illa or God, other than Allah? An odd question to ask the Meccans, since their primary deity was named Allah. Glory be to Allah from what they set up. Verse 44. Were they to see a piece of sky falling, they would say, Clouds gathered in heaps, so leave them alone until they encounter that day, where they shall swoon with terror. Their plotting will avail them not, and no help shall be given to them, so they shall receive their torment. Verily, for those who do wrong, there is another punishment besides this, but most of them understand not. 
The spirit of Islam is in a rut. The sky is falling. Men are swooning in terror. And there are ever more plots and punishments. No matter where one looks, the Quran is a very nasty book. Returning to the Hadith, we find Tabari in an effort to please his Shiite overlords, saying that Ali was the first male lured into Islamic submission. Ali was the first to accept Islam. He submitted at the age of nine. Now that we have three Muslims, let's take a quick inventory. Khadija founds Islam to salvage her recluse, suicidal husband's tattered reputation. She convinces him he is not cavorting with demons, and he adopts her profitable prophet plan. Amply motivated by revenge and greed, the dynamic duo assails their clan with claims equally preposterous and delusional. They were belittling the competition. Their alleged scripture was as demented as their motives were transparent. What's more, their anemic idol and his fanciful message were so infantile, every Meccan scoffs at the would-be prophet, save one nine-year-old child, and he's adopted under guess whose care? To body, one of the favors Allah bestowed on Ali bin Talib, Ali was Uncle Talib's son, hence Muhammad's cousin, was that the messenger was his guardian before Islam, and that occurred because. The Quraysh were afflicted by a severe drought. Muhammad said to his uncle Abbas, one of the richest Banu Hashim, Muhammad's clan, Abbas, your brother Abu Talib has many dependents, and you see how people are suffering. I will take one of his sons, and you take one. The champion of dads, Abu Talib said to them, As long as you leave me Akil, do as you wish. Muhammad took Ali. Our fellow scholars are agreed. Tabari says that Ali accepted Islam a year after the Prophet began his mission, and that he remained in Mecca for twelve years. As such, the score at the end of the Prophet's first year was Islam one, pagans four thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. But if Islam was low on converts, it was long on controversy. Abu Bakr, Muhammad's richest pal, future father-in-law, and caliph. Claimed he preceded Ali. O、oh, messenger, who has followed you in this religion? He replied, Two men have followed me in it: a free man and a slave, Abu Bakr and Bilal. The prophet misspoke when he said Bilal, Zibn bin Haritha, not to be confused with Zayed the Hanif, was the first to submit. He was owned by Khadija. She gave him to Muhammad. After some time, he adopted the boy. Making him his second son, companions of the Prophet say, the first man to believe and follow the Prophet was Zayed bin Haritha, his client or slave and adopted son. Ibn Ishaq says that the slave turned son was number two. Zayed was the first male to accept Islam and to pray after Ali. Then Abu Bakr accepted Islam. A word of caution is appropriate here. Freeing a slave and adopting him was a fine and upstanding thing to do, but before we lavish praise upon Muhammad, consider this: in Mecca, sons were considered a sign of godly favor. No sons, no favor. Muhammad's boys died in infancy, a strong signal to the Meccans that God had punished him. What's more, in an act we would call incest, the Prophet would come to steal Zayad's wife. In Medina, while his son was away terrorizing Meccans, Muhammad stumbled into her tent, saw her undressed, lusted, and took her for his own. Regardless of who was conned first, by the end of the fourth year, it was Islam four, pagans four thousand nine hundred and ninety-six. Tabari confirms the stealth prophet's slow start. Three years after the commencement of his mission, Allah commanded his prophet to proclaim the divine message which he had received publicly to the people. In the previous three years of his mission, until he was commanded to summon people openly, he had kept his preaching secret and hidden. At the time, Muslims were few in number and practiced their faith in secret. He was the world's first moot messenger. 
mistaken, Tabati states that Allah summoned the tongue-tied troubadour with these words from the 15th surah. So proclaim that which you are commanded, and withdraw from the polytheists. Quranic scholars say, however, that the 15th surah was 57th in order of revelation, not 3rd. Either the surahs are hopelessly jumbled, or somebody is terribly wrong. And that is a serious problem for Islam, because Tabati wrote the earliest and most revered Quran commentary. In the next paragraph, Tabati confirms that even the first Muslims were clueless when it came to the progression of surahs. After parading the 15th out as the third, he nominates the 26th for the fourth position. All three Quranic chronologists say that the 26th immediately preceded the 15th. Regardless of the score or progression, Becker was said to be a better salesman than Islam's Messiah. Many responded to his summons and accepted Islam. Some, however, needed a little encouraging. They came to blows, and Saad struck one of the polytheists with a camel's jawbone and split his head open. That leads us to the showdown at Uncle Abu's mud hut. This discussion is similar to the one chronicled earlier in Ishak Sira, but it is placed later in the flow of things by Tabati in his history. He claims that Hajjaj's eight sons went to Abu Talib and said, Your nephew, Muhammad, has reviled our gods, denounced our religion, derided our traditional values, and told us that our forefathers were misguided and burning in hell. Either curb his attacks on us or give us a free hand to deal with him, for you are as opposed to him as we are. This hadith suggests that Muhammad was the cause of his own grief. He denounced traditional Arab values and damned his ancestors. The Meccans wanted nothing more than for him to shush up. But no, he continued as before. The leadership returned to Talib once again. They said, We asked you to forbid your nephew from attacking us, but you did nothing. By Allah, we can no longer endure this vilification of our forefathers, this derision of our traditional values, and this abuse of our gods. We are told, This breach and enmity with his tribe weighed heavily on Abu Talib. The Meccans were responsible, rational, and restrained. They returned to Abu Talib a third, fourth, and fifth time. You are our elder and our chief, so give us justice against your nephew, and order him to desist from reviling our gods, and we will leave him to his god. At this point, Muhammad's god was not one of the Meccan gods, further evidence of the migration from our Rahman to Allah. Tabari, Abu Talib sent for Muhammad. Nephew, here are the sheikhs and nobles of your tribe. They have asked for justice against you. You should desist from reviling their god, and they will leave you to your god. Uncle, he said, shall I not summon them to something which is better than their gods? He was protesting that his god, Arachman, was better than their god, Allah. But how can that be? The Islamic religion was based upon the claim that Muhammad was Allah's messenger. Yet on this day, Muhammad wants to summon the Meccans to a god who is better than their Allah. Tabari, Abu Talib said to Muhammad, Nephew, how is it that your tribe is complaining of you and claiming that you are reviling their gods and saying this, that, and the other? The messenger said, I want them to utter one saying. If they can say it, the Arabs will submit to them and the non-Arabs will pay the jizya submission tax to them. This is another confirmation of the profitable profit plan. The sheikhs and nobles are alleged to have said something that contradicts the prior hadith. Yet it is no less debilitating to Allah's claim of divinity. Does Muhammad make the gods into one god? This is indeed an astounding thing. Muhammad combined the traits of six pagan idols, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Allah, Alat, Aluza, and Manat, into a single deity. He manufactured his god. The Quran confirms this admission in the 38th surah. Saad, the name of an Arabian moon god. I swear by the Quran, full of reminding. The noble Quran has a different take on the Saad intro. 
Sad, these letters are one of the miracles of the Quran, but none but Allah knows their meanings. Imagine that. Islam claims that nobody understands the final reminder to mankind. And so desperate are Muslims for miracles, incomprehensibility is called a sign of divinity. Then the Islamic God says that those who deny the senseless are arrogant and misinformed. Quran 38 verse 2 Nay, those who disbelieve are in false pride and opposition. This is followed by a little Islamic bragging. Quran 38 verse 3 How many generations have we destroyed before them? They cried out for mercy when it was too late for escape. They wonder that a warner has come to them from among themselves, and the disbelievers say, This prophet Muhammad is a sorcerer, a charlatan, and a wizard telling lies. He has made the Ahila, gods, into one Elah, God. This is a curious and strange thing, to be sure. Their leader said, Walk away from him. There is surely some motive behind this, something sought after, a thing he has designed against us. It is surely a forgery. Those who lived with Muhammad, dealt with him, worked with him, and listened to him, knew exactly who he was. He is a sorcerer, a charlatan, a wizard telling lies. They knew what he was doing. He has turned our gods into a single god. And they were never in doubt as to why. There is surely some motive behind it, something sought after. They even understood his means. It is a forgery. The eyewitnesses to the crime are unanimous in their testimony. A fraud has been perpetrated. Their eyewitness account has been retained in the Quran. But sadly, neither Muslims nor infidels are listening to what those who knew Muhammad best had to say. And that, perhaps, is the biggest crime of all. Then, as a mafia godfather would do today, the dark spirit of Islam threatened the eyewitnesses and intimidated the jury pool. Quran 38, verse 7 We have not heard of this in the religion of later days. This is nothing but an invention. What? Has this been sent to him? Nay, but they are in doubt about my reminder, this Quran. Nay, but they have not tasted my torment yet. Let them climb up the ladders to the heavens. They will be one more army vanquished among the many routed hordes. Forever lame, Allah, in trying to vindicate himself, confirmed his guilt. He just said that his heaven was hellish, a place where people are vanquished. But the cocky schoolyard bully wasn't finished gloating. He went on to list his all-in-one God's glorious achievements. Quran 38, verse 12. Before them belied the people of Noah, Ad, Pharaoh, and the man of stakes for punishment, Thamud, the people of Lot, and the wood dwellers, such were the confederates. They rejected my messengers, so my torment was justified. I've heard of justifiable homicide, but never justifiable torment. After confirming his pagan origins and proving his demented nature, the 38th surah reveals the dark spirit's lack of mental acuity. Allah introduces his listeners to David, the greatest Jewish king. He claims that King David was his votary, that he turned to him, not Yahweh, despite a mountain of evidence to the contrary. But damn the facts. Muhammad had people to subdue, credibility to usurp, power to grab, and money to steal. Quran 38, verse 17. We endued our slave David with power. It was we who subdued the hills to sing our praises with him at nightfall. And the birds were assembled, all obedient to him. We made his kingdom strong and bestowed Islamic prophethood on him. This delusional celestial songfest is followed by a meaningless story of runaway ewes. Then we learn, Quran 38 verse 24, It occurred to David that he was being tried by us, and he begged his Lord to forgive him and fell down prostrating himself in Islamic homage. According to Allah, King David was a Muslim. Can you imagine the conspiracy that would have had to have happened to write David's Islamic practices and devotion to Allah out of the Bible and his foe Jewishness in? 
Allah has to be the most delusional God ever conceived by man. Now that the Quran has pulverized what little credibility its God and Prophet might have possessed, it's time to say goodbye to the Sa'd Surah. 38 verse 27 We have not created the heavens and the earth and all that lies between for nothing. So woe to the unbelievers because of the fire of hell. The first nine words I believe. We have not created the heavens and earth and all that lies in between. Tabari. The situation deteriorated. Hostility became bitter and the people withdrew from one another displaying open hatred. Trying to salvage a deteriorating situation. The Meccan chiefs conspired to seduce their sons, brothers, and clansmen away from the new religion. It was a trial which severely shook the Muslims who had followed the Prophet. Some were seduced. So to salvage as many converts as possible, Muhammad commanded Muslims to emigrate to Abyssinia. The main body went to Abyssinia because of the coercion they were being subjected to in Mecca. His fear was that they would be seduced from their religion. There is a difference of opinion as to the number of those who emigrated in stealth and secret. Some say there were eleven men and four women. Even Ishak claims there were ten. It doesn't appear that the words of Islam were very convincing. A little coercion in the fragile band buckled. In the eighth year of Muhammad's reign as prophet, the score is Islam 15, pagans 4,985. It's little wonder Islamic states prohibit freedom of religion. Even Mohammed couldn't sell this stuff.